Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce to all of you our Honorable Chief Guest, His Holiness Radhanath Swamiji. He is the author of a best-selling book, The Journey Home, Autobiography of an American Swami, which traces Radhanath Swami's path from his middle-class Jewish upbringing in a Chicago suburb as Richard Slevin, to his participation in the civil rights movement in the 60s in USA, to his apprenticeships with Himalayan yogis, Dalai Lama, Mother Teresa, and several other known personalities he experienced along the way, and finally, how he developed real spiritual understanding. He has been a speaker at the Harvard Business School, as we heard from the President Ima, Stanford, Princeton University, NYU, Oxford, MIT, Columbia University, IIT Mumbai, Ahmedabad Management Association, HSBC Global Headquarters London, Ford Motor Company, Intel, Hewlett Packard, Starbucks, Milken Conference California, etc. He is held in the highest esteem by many of India's leading industrialists. Within the last few months, Radhanath Swamiji was invited to meet one-on-one -on -one with President of India, Srimati Pratibha Patil, as well as the U.S. President, Mr. Barack Obama. He was recently invited to address the MPs at the British Parliament House of Commons in London. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for His Holiness Radhanath Swamiji as I invite him to deliver the inaugural address. It is a great honor to have this opportunity to be with all of you today. Thank you so very much for having me. As I was sitting, I was remembering the first time I ever came to India. I was 19 years old. It was in the year of 1970. As was said, I was born and raised in Chicago, America, in the 1960s, which was a time of great social turbulence. There was a Vietnam War, there was the Civil Rights Movement. When you're 18 years old, you get drafted. And legally, you have two choices, go to jail or fight in a war. It was a war that many of us did not believe in. African American people in those days were imprisoned in the ghetto. And there was practically no way out because of the color of their skin. I was asking many questions. Why? In a country where we say it is the home of the free, why is freedom so selectively given? I was looking for meaning, fulfillment, and purpose. My father was quite a successful businessman. But I felt unless I have something meaningful and fulfilling to build my life upon, what really will I do for the world? So I went on a sociological exploration. And from London, I had no money. I hitchhiked across Europe, across the Middle East, to India to seek the treasures of the wisdom and culture of this country. Near-death experiences, diseases, over six months I finally reached the border. I was covered with dust. And the border guard told me I needed $200 to come in. I had nothing. I had 26 cents in four different currencies. She rejected me. I begged, I pleaded. She got angry. 
The border guards put guns in their face and told me, go back. I was in the no man's land between Pakistan and India. I didn't have a visa to get back into Pakistan. For six hours, I prayed, I cried, and finally there was a change at border guards. It was a Sikh gentleman. And with tears in my eyes, I begged him, please give me a chance. He said, I have been ordered by my superior officer to reject you. You cannot come in. My tears were not artificial. They were real. I begged him. I have come to find the treasures of your culture, of your spirituality, of your people. Just give me a chance. I promise you someday I will do something good for your people. He looked at me very intensely and said, sometimes a man must follow his heart. I will give you the chance that you are crying for. And then he stamped my passport and said, welcome to India. I was alone. I started walking in the Punjabi countryside. It was night. I didn't know where I was going. I, I never met an Indian in my life until I met that border guard. But I felt at home. I felt like I was being embraced by my mother. The culture of India is so valuable. The world really requires understanding it. Marketing is not just about the product. It is about the culture in which the product is marketing. That is going to affect the world today and our future generations. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells, Yad yad achadati istreistas tatat evitarojana, sayat pramanam kudute lokas taranuvartate. What leaders of society do will establish the principle that the people will follow. If we're not being instruments to make the world a better place in our business, in our marketing, in whatever we do, can it really be fulfilling? Is it really a success? It's interesting how people, even on the topmost level worldwide, are thinking in these terms now. With the great corruption in Wall Street, so many people now are asking, what really is important? Is it money? Is it profits? Or is it values? Last year I was invited to the Mike Milken Global Conference where some of the very, very topmost leaders of business, industry, politics, entertainment come together every year. I was asked to speak on giving a morning meditation to somehow or other give people, you know, some vision and direction in their lives. While I was there, I attended one particular conference or seminar within the conference. There was about 2,000 people there in this grand ballroom of the Beverly Hills Hotel. There was a panel on leadership. And on the panel was Mike Milken, Steve Wynn, who's the owner of many hotels, 
the CEO and president of Safeway Foods, one of the largest corporations in America. One lady who was the CEO of a pharmaceutical company that actually discovered more cures and medicines for cancer than anyone else in history. And Joe Torrey, who was the manager of the New York Yankees. You know what was interesting? During that conference, at the key points between Steve Wynn and Mike Milken, they quoted Mahatma Gandhi five times. In fact, the culmination of the entire session was Mahatma Gandhi's words. Be the change you want to see in the world. One of them said that his motto in life was the words of Gandhi, that my people of India, because I am your leader, I must follow you and care for you and understand what you want. Mike Milken showed a graph. He's really into statistics. And in this graph, he showed the study that if you pay a person what they need to be out of anxiety about their future and having a comfortable life, then you bring their creative productivity to this level. If you don't pay them enough, you can't because they're always in anxiety. But then he showed, once you give person that much pay, no matter how much you pay him more, even if it's ten times more, you do not get even a single percentage higher of a person's creative productivity. But the survey showed, if you give people a sense of value, a sense of appreciation, then the, val the productive creativity goes way, way up. It's not about money. It's about human relationships. It was interesting because Mike Milken asked Joe Torrey to speak about what his most fulfilling moment in his occupational life was, what he feels that he actually accomplished. Before that, they showed on the screen how the New York Yankees, they did not get into a playoff for 12 years. And then they hired Joe Torrey. And the press smashed him. They crushed him. Every press, the television, the newspapers, the magazines, they sing, this is the worst mistake. He's useless. He cannot lead the team. Joe Torrey said, one, one thing he learned is never listen to the media. Don't let them discourage you. In the next 10 years, the New York Yankees were in six playoffs and they won four World Series and he's considered one of the top five baseball managers in history as well as a Hall of Famer. So they asked, what do you think you accomplished in life? And he said, compared to this lady next to me who's curing people of cancer, I haven't done anything. Mike Milken said, well, among the 2,000 people here, at least half of us are New York Yankee fans. Baseball is kind of like cricket in America. He said, we feel you've accomplished something. He said, well, if I have to say the accomplishment I feel is most valuable, it's not about being a Hall of Famer. It's not about winning World Series. But when I was a child, I was from a home where I was abused terribly. Father was alcoholic. He said, There was so much misery and suffering in my house. Just to forget it, just to escape it, I would play baseball. And all my anger, all my anguish 
would go into playing baseball. And that's how I became so great. He said, I started an organization in New York City to help children from abusive, broken homes. He said, seeing those children who are otherwise suffering so bad, happy, giving them hope, giving them a sense of value and appreciation, that is far greater satisfaction than anything else I've done in my life. And then he said something very interesting. He said, actually, it wasn't my idea. This organization was my wife's idea. She deserves all the credit. He got a standing ovation from all these big business people. What really touches the heart? What is really meaningful in our life? This is so very important to understand in whatever we do. What are we marketing? It's not just the thing. It's the culture in which we do it. In a cultured society, we love people and use things. But all too often in today's world, we love things and use people. We are possessed by our possessions instead of using them for a useful purpose. Martin Luther King has stated, the irony of our times is we have guided missiles and misguided people. So much distraction. Wherever we go, we are bombarded by weapons of mass distraction, distracting us from the very goal and purpose of our life. In Mumbai, two of my very dearest friends are Aravind Mafatlal and his son Rishikesh Mafatlal. Recently, they went through a very, very serious crisis in their business. And it looked like it was going to sink completely. They were in something like Chapter 11, the India's version, reorganization. And many of their top people left. But some of their top people, because they felt so valued, appreciated, and cared for in that company, they stayed with them. They felt more than just the money. They felt this company was like a family to them. And it was they who worked hard, even though they got lower salaries, without any assurance that they'd ever get a promotion or any higher salary. And they brought the company together and made it quite successful. It was all because they believed in the care, the value that they received. Earlier last year, I spoke at the Ford Motor Company in Detroit And after my talk, I met several of the directors of the departments. And it was interesting because every one of them that I spoke to, their father worked for the Ford Motor Company for 40 years. Their grandfather worked for the Ford Motor Company for 40 years. And now they're, you know, almost 40 years working. And Ford was going down, but it was people like this who actually brought it up on the basis of creating quality products that people actually want. This human side of life is so much required. The culture of compassion, the culture of 
doing the right thing in such a way that we lead a legacy to future generations to make the world a better place. India has such a culture. I remember my spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada. In 1969, he was in London, England. And a newspaper journalist asked him, why have you come to London? He said, the British ruled over India for so many years. And the British took so much of the wealth, so much of the treasures from India and brought it to England. But you forgot one thing. You forgot the greatest, most valuable treasure that we have. Our spiritual culture and values. And I have come here to give you freely what you have forgotten to take. There's a saying that in every heart there's a good dog and there's a bad dog. The good dog represents compassion, humility, forgiveness, morality, and the bad dog represents envy, greed, selfish passions, anger, arrogance. The two bugs in each of us are always fighting to see who's going to preside over the other. In many cases, I think we all have this experience. Sometimes that bad dog really howls. <coughs> and the good dog is... <coughs> Which dog is going to win? The one that we choose to feed. Culture means, in very simple analysis to feed the good dog of our virtues and to neglect the bad dog. And this must be implemented in whatever we do. And through our actions, it must be marketed throughout the world. My Guru Srila Prabhupada, when he was 71 years old, he was in New York City. He had just taken a boat from Calcutta to New York. He only had 40 rupees, which in those days was equivalent to $8. But the problem is, Nobody wanted rupees in America in 1965. He couldn't change them. So he had nothing and he knew no one. He was sitting on a park bench and somebody asked him, Swami, what do you do? And Srila Prabhupada, who didn't have a single follower, who didn't have a single penny, who had nothing. He said, I have tens and thousands of followers. I have hundreds of temples and ashrams all over the world. And millions of books are being distributed of Bhagavad Gita and other scriptures. He said, it is only separated by time. 
And a few years later, because he believed in what he wanted to give the world, he did it. There were so many failures that came to him. Winston Churchill, his definition of success was to go through failure after failure after failure after failure and not lose your enthusiasm to succeed. That in itself is real success. Walt Disney, his first job as an animator in a company, he was fired because they said, you have no creativity, you should find another line of work. But he wasn't discouraged. He had enthusiasm. A few years later, Srila Prabhupada was in Mumbai, and he was in a group with people who were very, very um, prominent industrialists and business people of India. And he said, when I came to America, I had 40 rupees, and I didn't know anybody. And now, thousands and thousands of people are marketing this bhakti, this spirit of devotion and culture. And I don't pay them anything. Thousands of people from America and Europe and lakhs and lakhs of rupees are coming every day and we don't even ask for it. If only we have the right values. If only we understand that the grace of God, whatever name we call, the grace of God is a power beyond our own that can inspire us, that can empower us, that can rise us above all obstacles. If we have values. You see, when we look at history, it's not so much who you are or what you have. It's the values that you cherish and live by that make a person a great woman or a great man. This hotel is very beautiful. It's very special for me because when I first came to India in 1970, whenever I came through Delhi, because I was mostly in the Himalayas or Vrindavan or other holy places, because I had nothing, I would sleep under a tree in the park of Connaught Circus. and I would go to a Hanuman temple to take a bath with sadhus. And now here I am speaking in this beautiful hotel. Destiny is inconceivable, unimaginable. We may say beautiful woodwork, wonderful, wonderful chandelier, such nice architecture and design of this building. Well, how many people are thinking, this building has a fantastic foundation? The foundation is so much underrated. But the fact is, without the strong foundation, everything we build upon it, when there's a storm, it will collapse. It's so important to take the responsibility to develop a strong foundation in our own life. In the Bible, Lord Jesus tells that if you build your house on shifting sand, when the storm comes, it will collapse. If you build it on strong rock, no storm can touch it, disturb it. We're so much given way to stress and anxiety, and frustration, and envy, and depression. We're so much given way to compromise our values. 
due to fear of losing something or the passion to get something. But if we have a strong foundation of inner fulfillment, inner meaning, then we could live with integrity. We could live with real culture. And we could actually be the change that we want to see in this world. And whatever product we're marketing, we know we're actually, by our example, by our standards, by our values, we are really making the world a better place. That is fulfillment. India at this time has the most incredible opportunity to affect the world. When I came in just at the end of the 1960s, the only thing I knew about India was disease, overpopulation, and snakes. But somehow or other, I got some books about the wisdom of India, which brought me here. Today, India is one of the most powerful economies, one of the most influential nations in business, in, in, in industry, in production, in the world. India really has a voice. With that voice, if we give the world the beautiful culture, we could really, India, could make such a great contribution to the planet. As a Western person, I see Jews, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, Parsis, Buddhists, everybody has given, been given such freedom and opportunity in this nation. There are women who have been presidents, prime ministers, heads of business. It's incredible. India is so open because there's such a culture of truth and compassion. My humble request to all of you, along with effectively marketing the products that you sell, market the beautiful culture and values of your great land. They are universal and desperately required for the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Holiness. What an inspirational address. We are all inspired by your presence and by your words.